Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture 7 of IoT. Uh, I'm Neda and today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, language connectivity with LoRaWAN. So the uh, uh, first topic is about introduction to LoRa and LoRaWAN and then LoRaWAN network architecture, LoRaWAN protocol specifications, and uh, LoRaWAN network coverage, and LoRaWAN network servers. And then at the end, we will see how we can implement, uh, I mean, how, uh, the hands-on, how we send data using uh, LoRaWAN uh, network. Uh, so let's just start with the first part. Um, here, uh, the provided link to uh, the Things Network uh, documents is uh, a valuable resource for you that um, you are maybe eager to explore the vast possibilities of LoRaWAN uh, technology. Uh, and it offers a comprehensive and um, enlightening guide to deepen your understanding of LoRaWAN wireless communication protocol. So it's a useful link to use it. And also there is a YouTube link here that presents an informative uh, video that holds the potential to captivate, uh, captivate your uh, curiosity and offer valuable insights and knowledge in an engaging format. So I recommend these two uh, links if you want to be a master in the LoRa one and LoRa. So let's start with uh, LoRa. Uh, LoRa, as its name shows and stands, is long range. It is a wireless technology that operates in, an, in the audio frequency range. It uses a spread spectrum modulation technique, which is a way of encoding information on LoRa waves. LoRa operates in specific radio frequency bands that uh, don't require a monthly subscription, and uh, these bands include uh, 915 megahertz that is used in US and Australia and 868 megahertz that is used in Europe and 433 megahertz that is used in Asia. Uh, there's also a 2.4 gigahertz band uh, for the ISM which means industrial science and medical uh, band uh, but it has a shorter range. To transmit uh, uh, data, uh, LoRa encodes information on radio waves using chirp pulses, which is a method similar to um, how dolphins and bats communicate. Uh, uh, later, I will show you the uh, short video that how the um, it works, how it is. And uh, LoRa is capable of a long range communication, uh, reaching distances of up to fifteen kilometers. And however, this comes at the expense of a narrow bandwidth. It means that it can transmit data at lower rates compared to technologies like uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, LoRa is capable of long range communication and it reach, reaches distances of up to 15 kilometers. Uh, and um, uh, due to the characteristic of LoRa, uh, it's well suited for applications that need to transmit a small amount of data with uh, low bit rates. Uh, it's particularly useful for sensors and actuators that operate in uh, low power mode as LoRa's technology allows for energy efficient communication. So there's a link here that in the docs, if you go to LoRaWAN and see the regional parameters, you will see that these different uh, bands, uh, they are applied in this regional parameter. When you are setting it up, you, you need to set up, when you are in Europe, you need to use uh, 868 megahertz. So... Uh, this is a note here that LoRa is not a replacement for IoT technology. It's complementary to other IoT technologies. We have devices that both have a Wi-Fi transceiver as well as LoRa and only enable Wi-Fi if um, your devices need high throughput. 
And uh, let's see uh, LoRaWAN. Uh, LoRaWAN is a media access control layer protocol. So LoRaWAN is a protocol and LoRa is a technology. So LoRaWAN is built on top of LoRa modulation. And LoRaWAN is a software layer that defines how devices use the LoRa hardware, for example, when they transmit and the format of messages. Uh, the LoRaWAN protocol is developed and maintained by the LoRa Alliance. And the first LoRaWAN specification uh, was released in January 2015. But why LoRaWAN? Uh, let's see, what is the advantages? Uh, what is the properties of LoRaWAN? LoRaWAN is ultra low power and is suitable for transmitting small size payloads like sensor data over long distances uh, it's long range and it's up to five kilometers in urban areas and up to 15 kilometers in rural areas and uh, this is deep indoor penetration support it supports the uh, uh, when, when you put it in an indoor environment uh, so it has an end-to-end -end security and it uses 128 bit aes uh, connection uh, which is an algorithm for secure the keys when you are sending uh, messages uh, via the uh, LoRaWAN network. And uh, the other um, feature is that it is geolocation and the network can determine the location of your devices. And you can do uh, a firmware update uh, over the air. Uh, later we will see we have uh, two methods of um, firmware updating. So LoRaWAN supports uh, firmware update over the air. And then uh, it's license-free spectrum and it's not needed to obtain a license to deploy the LoRaWAN network. And it's, uh, LoRaWAN is also unique in the ability to deploy uh, both uh, public and private networks uh, with the very same devices, very same gateways and software. And there is a very large uh, ecosystem of device makers, uh, gateway makers, and network service providers, as well as application developers. So if we look at this photo, that it was the bandwidth um, versus range, LoRa modulation provides a significantly greater communication range with low bandwidth than other competing wireless and data transmission technologies. So uh, if you remember, we talked about this uh, uh, graph in lecture three, which was about the um, IoT te um, technologies, uh, sorry, communication technologies. And uh, we saw that the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, has high bandwidth, but high bandwidth, as you can see, they are here, but the range that they support the cover is, is short. It's up here if we see the long um, axis. So, but LoRa, as it names, it shows it's a long range and covers long range, but the bandwidth um, is lower compared to the Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth. And also, uh, there are some devices, uh, when we, uh, LoRaWAN devices, and uh, they can be a sensor, an actuator, or both. And devices are battery operated. Uh, and um, devices are wirelessly connected to the LoRaWAN network uh, through gateways using uh, LoRa radio frequency modulation. Uh, we, we got to know uh, these devices when I uh, was talking about in lecture one uh, about the devices. So you're familiar with this kind of devices. That is a device that consists of temperature, humidity, and fall detection sensor. And this is a pressure sensor. Uh, and um, this is um, a lower one temperature and humidity sensor. And also the gateways that can be in these shapes and uh, each gateway is um, registers using configuration setting to a LoRaWAN network server. So if you are going to use a LoRaWAN uh, network, you need to have a LoRaWAN gateway and you need to register it in the, uh, when, when registered in the uh, 
LoRaWAN network server. When you, uh, we will learn later that in TTN, when we are going to work uh, with TTN, uh, that is a, a LoRaWAN network server, then there uh, we need to register our uh, gateway, um, LoRaWAN gateway. So you need if you don't have your own LoRaWAN gateway, you need to have this coverage and use that uh, uh, coverage for connection. So uh, Gateway receives LoRa messages from end devices and simply forward them to the LoRaWAN network server. And Gateways are connected to the network server using a backhaul-like uh, cellular, um, um, like LTE, 4G, and 5G, and Wi-Fi, and Ethernet, and fiber uh, optic, or um, 2.4 gigahertz radio links. Uh, so let's see um, the LoRaWAN network architecture. Uh, the end devices, uh, which can be, let's, uh, sorry, Let's start from the left here. The end devices, which can be sensors or actuator, gather data from their surroundings or perform actions based on instructions. And these end devices communicate with the gateways by sending LoRa modulated wireless messages. They can also receive messages wirelessly back from the gateways. The end devices initiate uplink messages and uh, the uplink message refers to the information that transmitted from end device, uh, like a sensor, to the network. And it carries data collected by the device, such as temperature reading or motion detection, and is sent wirelessly using LoRa modulation to the gateway. From the gateway, the uplink message is forwarded to the network server for further processing and analysis. So essentially, the uplink message is like the device raising its hand uh, to share information with the network. And the gateways act as intermediary intermediaries between the end devices and the network server. The gateways are transparent. Uh, which means that they receive messages from the uh, end devices and then uh, forward them to the network server for further processing and analysis. This ensures that the data from the end devices reach reaches the uh, right destination. Once the messages reach the network server, it takes um, charge of uh, managing the entire network. It kept keeps um, track of the gateways and devices, applications and users and acts as a central coordinator. Look, think, think of it as a central coordinator and ensures that all components work together harmoniously and efficiently. The application server plays a crucial role in securely processing application-specific data messages. It gets the data uh, to manage the devices, to check the status, to send messages back, and that's typically an um, internet API. The application server takes the information gathered by the end devices, analyzes it, and performs actions based on the specific applications running on the network. A lot of a network can have more than one application server. It's not like that we have only one. We can have more than application more than one application server. So uh, I will talk about the downlink and uplink messages later, but if you remember, we had data and command in our remote sending and remote controlling chart. And in LoRaWAN literature, the data is equal to the uplink message, which means that the data is sent by the device to the gateway, that our application server is hosted there. Uh, and the command message is the downlink message, which is sent by the gateway or application server to the device. Um, let's say uh, we have large scale of devices that are sending data every second, then suddenly the need of transmission frequency is changed. So we can easily meet this need with downlink message to all the devices. That's how the uplink and downlink messages are uh, defined. So when new devices want to join the network, the joint server comes into play. It 
processes join request messages sent by the end devices and allows them to become part of the network. It facilitates uh, uh, the integration of new devices and uh, ensures a, a smooth onboarding process. So it's worth mentioning that the network server employs message data application to maintain the efficiency of the network. If it receives uh, multiple copies of the uh, same message, it intelligently keeps only a single copy and uh, discards the duplicates. This helps prevent uh, clutter and unnecessary redundancy in the system. Uh, and um, also, if you remember, in lecture three, we compared the connection using Wi-Fi and LoRaWAN. Uh, and uh, we mentioned that we need LoRaWAN network, uh, LoRaWAN gateway and LoRaWAN network uh, server. And this uh, LoRaWAN network server is placed either on the gateway or on the backend. So uh, we have devices, we have gateway, we have network server, we have application server and joint server all here that can be hosted on gateway or on backend. And uh, it was how the LoRaWAN connection was working. Uh, so if uh, if you had it in your mind, this is very simple to uh, understand that uh, this is a typical uh, LoRaWAN network implementation from end to end. When you have your devices, you have your gateways, and um, you have the uh, LoRaWAN network server, and you have joint server, you have application servers, and then uh, you have your dashboard or data portals. If you want to learn more about this, I will uh, recommend you see this um, documentation that is from Semtech. And it's uh, uh, explained deeply how they are working. So let's see what are uh, LoRaWAN protocol specifications. Message types, security, keys, and device classes, device activation, authentication, spreading factors, or SF, and LoRaWAN limitations that they are um, most important uh, uh, specification in LoRaWAN protocol, and I'm going to talk about um, each of them. So message types. In LoRaWAN, um, the, as I mentioned before, the data is equal to the uplink message which means that the data is sent by the device to the gateway where your application server, network server, they are uh, hosted. And the common message is the top downlink message, which is sent by the gateway where your application server and network server is hosted to the device. So, um, that's why we have uh, two kind of messages, uplink and downlink messages. Security. Uh, LoRaWAN uh, version 1.0, uh, because we have two versions, LoRaWAN uh, 1.0 and LoRaWAN 1.1. LoRaWAN 1.0 specifies a number of security keys that they are called network security key. Uh, as you can see, we, sh we show like this, network, NWK, S as a security and key. And app security key, app security and key, and app key, application key. So all keys have a length of uh, 128 bits, and the algorithm used for this is AES-128, similar to the algorithm that used in the uh, 802.15.4 standard. So uh, the network um, uh, session, if you, if you look at here, network uh, security key and application security key, they are belong to the session keys. And the uh, application key is belong to the application keys. So session keys uh, is when a device joins the network 
this is called a join or activation. An application session key, that is apps key, and the network session key, uh, network as key, th these two are generated when a device joins the network. The network session key is shared with the network while the application session key is kept private. And these session keys will be used for the duration of the session. So we have also application keys. When the, uh, the application key um, is only known by the device and by the application. Dynamically activated devices uh, that I, I will talk about um, how it is activated or authorized, this method, OTA, use the application key, app key, to drive the two session uh, keys during the activation procedure. Uh, in the Things Network or TTN, you can have a default app key which will be used to activate all devices or customize the app key pair device. Uh, the network session key uh, is used for interaction between the node and the network server, if you, if you want to say that. And this key is used to validate the integrity of each message by its message integrity code, MIC check. Um, and this MIC is similar to the checksum, except that it prevents uh, intentional tampering with the message. For this, LoRaWAN uh, uses AESC MAC, and in back of the back end of the um, TTN, this validation is also used to map a non-unique device address uh, to a unique device uh, um, address that we call it Dev EUI and App EUI. And the uh, application uh, session key uh, is used for encryption and de decryption uh, of the payload. The payload is fully encrypted uh, between the node and, um, and the handler application server components of the um, TTN. It means that nobody except you is able to read the contents of messages you send or receive. Um, so, in, in brief, these two session keys, I mean, network, server, network security key and app security key are unique per device, per session. And if you dynamically activate your device, I mean, OTA, these keys are regenerated on every activation. If you statically um, activate your device that it will be another method, ABP, that I'm going to talk about it, these keys stay the same until you change them. If you wanna learn about, if you wanna learn more about these keys, you need to look at the, this documentation that is in LoRaWAN and security part. Uh, device classes. So, LoRa, as we said, is a, here is a physical layer, uh, and uh, as you can see here, it's a layer um, uh, below. So uh, you have different regions and different bands. Um, I mentioned in Europe and in US and in uh, Asia. Uh, so, in the US and in the Asia, uh, um, as I mentioned, you can use uh, different frequencies. And um, the, the, the things that uh, we have here, uh, we have different classes in, um, in on top of the LoRa, uh, when we come in the uh, LoRa one part, the yellow part that is, is uh, uh, where LoRa one comes, uh, which is a Mac layer media control, and this Mac layer is doing all the security features in LoRa one and activating devices on a network, frame counting, acknowledging messages, and synchronizing the windows that your application can send data to the end device. But here you can see 
that we have three different classes, class A, class B, and class C, which refers to different operational modes or schedules that determine how devices communicate with the LoRaWAN network. Um, and uh, we are going to see what are difference between these three classes. And on top of that, you will see that uh, your IoT application uh, is placed. Uh, before we go to the different classes, uh, to the explanation of different classes, I want to say that in LoRa device classes, the term window refers to a specific time periods during which the devices are available to receive downlink messages from the network server. So um, if I talk about uh, the, in the classes, if you see this uh, word window, it means uh, this time periods. So class A. In class A, uh, devices have uh, two receive windows known as RX1 and RX2. After transmitting an uplink messages um, to the network server, the device opens RX1 window to listen for a response from the server. If no downlink message is received during RX1, the device opens RX2 window, which typically has a longer delay and uses a, a different frequency. The RX1 and RX2 windows are short time slots following the device uplink transmission. A class B uh, devices have periodic uh, receive windows such as a class A. Class B devices also open scheduled uh, receive windows at specific times synchronized with the network's beacon, uh, which uh, allows for more frequent downlink communication from the network server to the device. The additional functionality results in higher power consumption compared to class A devices. So the networks beacon serves as a, a reference point for the time synchronization and is broadcasted by the gateway or base station at regular intervals. It contains information such as the network identifier, timestamp and other parameters necessary for device uh, synchronization. Class C devices have a continuous receive window, except when they are actively transmitting data. It means that they are all the time are listening. So when they are all the time listening, it means that they are using more power. So uh, you will see in the um, uh, next implementation part, if we are going to define our classes, we define it as a class A because class C, it uses lots of power and we don't want that uh, power consumption is important. So uh, we want to um, uh, um, stop it. So it means that the div in class C, the device uh, remains uh, open to receive downlink message from the network server at any time and providing near real-time communication capabilities. So you should look at your application. If, um, if your uh, KPI, I mean key performance indicator, is that you're you concerned about power consumption, so you shouldn't use class C. But if you are, um, your KPI is that you are uh, concerned about the real-time communication, so the class C maybe is more pro um, suitable because it's always all the time listening and it's uh, providing a near real-time communication capability for you. So uh, since these devices keep continuously opening the uh, receive window, um, as I said, uh, this, uh, more power com this use more power compared to the uh, devices of class A and class B. Uh, and um, we will see in the things stack the TTN or TTS or Helium that uh, we are choosing the device of class A. And device activation authentication methods. We have two methods of uh, authentication, uh, which one is uh, activation by personalization or in brief ABP. And the other one is uh, over the time authentication or in brief OTA uh, or OTAA. So 
let's see what is ABP. ABP uh, directly ties an end device to a pre-selected network and bypassing the over-the-air activation, activation procedure. ABP is uh, less secure activation method compared to the OTAA. And ABP also has the downside that uh, devices cannot switch network providers without manually changing um, keys in the device. And the joint server is not involved in the ABP uh, process. Also, an end device activated using the ABP method can only work with a single network and keeps the same security session for its entire uh, lifetime. If you want to know uh, more about this activation methods, you can look at this link. The other um, methods is um, uh, over the time authentication, and it's the most secure and recommended activation method for um, end devices. With the uh, auto method, the MCU or microcontroller sent a join request to the LoRaWAN gateway using the app UI and app key that's provided in the LoRaWAN application. Uh, let's say you are working with TTN or Chirpa Stack network server and you have the application there. So you will have these two keys. If the keys are correct, the gateway will reply to the microcontroller uh, with a join accept message. And from that point, uh, on the microcontroller is able to send and receive packets to or from the gateway. If the keys are not uh, are incorrect, are incorrect or are not correct, uh, no response will be received, and the uh, has join method will always return false. If everything works correctly, the device will print joined to the terminal, and uh, you should see a data packet arrive in your LoRaWAN application that contains uh, this format that is hexadecimal format, and we will see it later in the implementation part. Uh, so um, we will mostly be going through auto method of connecting to LoRaWAN uh, because it is more secured and it is uh, simpler to use. Uh, so in the config file, uh, in, uh, when we are creating, uh, we will use uh, devices. We will use this method for authentication and uh, activation. Uh, uh, since we are going to use OTA or uh, over the air activation, uh, we have in LoRa one version 1.0, we have. And the join procedure requires two MAC messages that to be exchanged between the end device and the network uh, server. Um, please note that here in, in this version, the, the version of uh, 1.0, we have communication between uh, end device and network server. So join request uh, from the end device to the net network server happens and device to the network server and join accept from network server to the mm, end device will happen number one and number three and uh, this is how end device network server and application server uh, works first you send join request then here a uh, network server processes the join request and uh, and processes the session key generation and uh, it will produce uh, apps, apps uh, security key and network uh, security key and after that it will answer with the join accept and then uh, in at the at step four it keeps network security key and um, send uh, or distribute this uh, application security key to the application server and at the end the session key generation uh, you have here that you will have application security key and network security key but if you look at here that it is lura one uh, version 1.1 the join procedure requires two mac messages uh, to be exchanged between the end device and join server so since in the new version we have this server we have join server the um, this um, 
Mac, um, how to say, uh, uh, exchanging the request happens between um, end device and joint server. And this is the how this end device, network server, and joint server and application server work all together. If you want to learn more about this, uh, it, there is always there is a link. Um, I think I forgot to bring the link, but it's uh, super easy to search about it, and you will uh, find this uh, documentation in the LoRaWAN TTN. So. In Lora 1.1, uh, 1 .1, in this version, app EUI is replaced with the join EUI. So when you are going to create um, your app EUI, I mean, uh, when there is a field that you are going to generate app EUI, at that time it is called join EUI. So uh, this is, uh, I, I brought this to a slide that, you show you that uh, in uh, different versions, there are different uh, message communication. Uh, so uh, there is a note here that uh, if the dev UI, it means device UI, is not provided, the LoRa Mac of the device will be used in its place. You can. If, let's say you have you buy a device and you cannot see what is your dev UI. Then in this case you can use LoRa Mac of your device and you will need to change the dev, dev UI in your LoRa One application to the LoRa Mac address of the device. But uh, it, it's um, and then we are going to set the device uh, super easy and we wouldn't uh, need this uh, code. Uh, but in this, in a case that you are you don't have your dev UI, uh, you can get the LoRa Mac using this snippet code. <clears throat> Let's see what is a, a spreading factor. Um, LoRa is based on chirp spread uh, spectrum technology, where chirps uh, that are also known as symbols are the carrier of data. Um, I'm sure that uh, if we uh, see a video about it, and uh, this is the link to that video, and I brought it here uh, to uh, show here that how it works, you will get a better idea uh, how it's uh, CSS technology and uh, how LoRa is based on that. So let's see first the video about it, and then uh, we will back to this slide. A plain radio signal carries no information, apart from the fact that the transmitter is being left on. The signal has to be modified in some way to be used to convey information, and there are a number of ways in which this can be done. Two of the most popular methods are to modify the amplitude and the frequency, and these will be familiar from the fronts of the traditional radio, AM and FM amplitude and frequency modulation. Listeners to AM radio will be aware that it's more susceptible to interference from natural and man-made sources because it's not as sophisticated as FM, which is clear and resilient, and is a more complex and unnatural waveform. AM and FM will be easily recognized because of their widespread use in broadcasting. Here, we're not concerned with music and speech, but just binary ones and zeros. Digital one and zero signals could be sent using AM by just keying the signal on and off. Crude, but effective. With FM, one frequency could be used to represent a one and the second for a zero. This is also a common method and called frequency shift keying, FSK. We can see the signal jumping between its two frequencies here and recorded below in what is called a waterfall display. FSK is important as it's simple to produce and detect and is referred to in LoRa radio transmissions. But LoRa goes further and in doing so becomes more complex and even more resilient to background noise. Rather than just use the two frequencies of FSK, it sweeps between the two like this, up and down. Now, there are two parameters that may be changed on both the rising and falling signals. These are the rate at which the sweep changes, call this the sweep rate, and the range over which the sweep could change, call this the bandwidth. 
there are always compromises in communications, and here there are compromises in both sweep rate and bandwidth. Increasing the bandwidth provides a better quality signal, but bandwidth is at a premium. Everybody is vying for space and bandwidth is valued and restricted. Engineering involves maximizing performance using minimal resources. Bandwidth specified for LoRa are therefore restricted under international agreement to 500 kHz, 250 kHz and 125 kHz, and in Europe further restricted to just 250 kHz and 125 kHz. A slow sweep rate is easy to decode and becomes progressively more difficult the faster the change. Here's another potential trade-off. The faster the sweep rate, the more information can be passed, but the more difficult it is to accurately resolve the signal. The European system uses six different sweep rates or spreading factors as they're referred to. These are referenced by numbers 7 to 12. We've already seen that LoRa devices use a lower which is a protocol where any device can just wake up and transmit, regardless of any other existing conversations. As an alert, a device will start by sending this unique training cycle of eight up sweeps, followed by two down sweeps. We can break these sweeps into symbols of equal period. The block of eight is called the preamble, and followed by two symbols used for timing, called the synchronizing symbols. Any listening device can clearly recognize this preamble as the beginning of a packet, which alerts its attention. The transmitting device is then time limited by which it must complete the rest of its transmission. All of the data content of the packet is contained in the following symbols. Each symbol contains a discrete frequency step representing eight bits. The data contained in each sweep is probably best shown using these examples. The details, like all good comedy, is in the timing. Oh. A plane ready. Um, now, the spreading factor controls the chirp rate and thus controls the speed of data transmission. Lower spreading factors means faster chirps and therefore a higher data transmission rate. For every increase in the spreading factor, the chirp sweep rate is halved and so the data transmission rate is halved. Lower spreading factors reduce the range of LoRa transmissions because they reduce the processing gain and increase the bit rate. Changing the spreading factor allows the network to increase or decrease the data rate for each end device at the cost of range. And the network also uses spreading factors to control congestion. And spreading factors are uh, orthogonal, uh, so signals modulated with different spreading factors and transmitted on the same frequency channel at the same time do not interfere with uh, each other. So if you look at here uh, and look at this table, the lower uh, SF here, SF0, supports shorter range. It's two kilometers compared to the um, bigger um, uh, SF, that is SF10. It supports eight kilometers. And lower uh, SF is supports shorter range and the less time on air also is less. Uh, and so since the less time on air is less, the energy consumption is lower. Then, um, the data rate is higher. So you keep in mind that uh, they are, uh, how they are related to each other. For example, in SF10, uh, spreading factor 10, uh, the bit rate is less than the spreading factor 7 here. It's only 980 bits per second, but it can uh, cover longer range, 8 kilometers, and uh, the time on the air is uh, also um, higher, 371 millimeter, uh, milliseconds. Sorry. And let's see what are the LoRaWAN limitations. LoRaWAN is not uh, suitable for every use case. So it's important that uh, you, uh, you understand the limitation. And um, here, uh, long range uh, um, is suitable for multiple uh, 
in kilometers and the low power that can last years on a battery and uh, low cost less than uh, 200 sorry 20 euro um, capital expenditure expenditure uh, per node and almost no uh, operational um, expenditure and the low bandwidth between 250 bits per uh, second and 11 kilo uh, bits per second in Europe and um, coverage everywhere you are the network just install your own gateways and it you will have coverage everywhere and it's secured uh, 128 bit end to end uh, encrypted and here it shows that uh, where LoRa one is not suitable for real-time data you can only send a small packet every couple of minutes and for phone calls you can do it with uh, LTE not with LoRa and for controlling lights in your house you should uh, use Bluetooth or Zigbee technologies and uh, for sending photos watching for example Netflix uh, you should use Wi-Fi. Uh, so you can see that in these use cases, you, you should not uh, use LoRaWAN. Um, but uh, LoRaWAN network coverage, uh, LoRaWAN has uh, witness uh, widespread adoption and deployment across the globe with more than 150 countries uh, that embrace this technology. This vast reach shows cases the global appeal and uh, versatility of the LoRaWAN that en enables IoT solutions. To support the expansive network of LoRaWAN devices, there are uh, approximately 150 LoRaWAN network um, operators worldwide, and these operators plays a, um, play a crucial role in managing and maintaining the LoRaWAN networks in their respective regions. To ensure reliable and efficient connectivity, there are over 90 thousand LoRa one gateways deployed globally and this gateway serves uh, serve as the bridge between the end devices and the network servers which facilitates the communication of data and uh, comments and the extensive presence of LoRaWAN networks, network operators, and gateways uh, demonstrate the uh, scalability and popularity of this technology in meeting the demands of uh, various industry and use cases. With its long-range, low-power capabilities, LoRaWAN continues to enable innovative IoT solutions across a diverse range of sectors that includes smart cities, agriculture, and industrial automation, and more. Um, I, as you can see here, I brought this TTN mapper, and uh, uh, that you can see the uh, LoRaWAN gateways, uh, how they are covering the... Um, on uh, the on the globe and also the helium um, network server LoRaWAN network server that you can go to these links and see the uh, helium coverage and uh, also the uh, the thing networks uh, coverage so let's see uh, the types of antenna that exist. An antenna is a device used to transmit or receive electromagnetic waves, uh, typically in the form of radio waves or microwaves. And antenna acts as a transducer which converts the electrical signals into electromagnetic waves for transmission or converting electromagnetic waves into electrical signals for uh, reception and uh, they play a crucial role in various communication systems uh, like broadcasting, wireless communication, and uh, radar system, and satellite communication, and many uh, other applications where the transmission or reception of electromagnetic waves is required. Uh, we have a um, wire antenna that looks like, like this. This is the wire antenna. 
and uh, is a type of antenna that uses a conducting wire or a set of wires to transmit or receive radio frequency signals. It is one of the simplest and most commonly used types of uh, antennas and is known um, for its uh, versatility versatility and effectiveness across a wide range of frequencies also uh, this kind of wires i mean with antennas i mean wire antennas comes in various shapes and configuration and each designed to optimize performance for a specific application and uh, frequency ranges Wire antennas have several advantages. They are relatively easy to construct, cost-effective, and can be scaled to operate over a wide range of frequencies. Wire antennas are also flexible uh, and can be easily deployed in different um, configurations such as horizontal, vertical, or uh, sloping. And um, the only problem, I mean, the disadvantage of their of them is that uh, their performance can be influenced by factors such as height above ground, surrounding objects, and uh, nearby electromagnetic uh, interference. The next one is PCB antenna. Then these antennas are made from a copper uh, trace uh, drawn directly onto a PCB, as you can see here. And they are great for high volume production and uh, suitable for indoor use. The next one is a spring antenna. And uh, this antenna also called a coil antenna or helical um, antennas and are made from coil wires and uh, usually copper or aluminum that reduce the antenna's length. And spring antennas are suitable for use with LoRa modules with low transmission power, uh, up to 100 milliwatt. And uh, spring antennas are also perfect for end devices with a space constraint. The other one is a rubber duck antenna. And uh, rubber duck antennas are made from uh, plastic rubber and uh, the outside and the copper aluminum and the actual and inside and uh, rubber duck antenna are ideal um, ideal uh, for LoRa nodes and indoor gateways uh, so uh, I brought this uh, photo here uh, as you can see this is LoRa one antenna the rubber duck one the, exactly this one that we talk about uh, mm, for this course, you will need uh, this um, antenna with this modem that is called LoRa One transmitter or modem uh, with this um, jumper wire that one side is grooved and one side is not grooved. So, as a, a general rule, as it is mentioned here, you should not operate any um, devices that transmit radio signals uh, like transmitter or modems without attaching an antenna to them. Uh, this rule applies to all types of radio frequency devices, not just LoRa technology. When you transmit radio signals without an antenna, uh, the energy from the transmission bounces back because there is no proper path for it uh, to follow. This reflected energy uh, can cause damage to the equipment and uh, potentially rendering it um, uh, useless or reducing its performance. So to protect your equipment in, and ensure it functions correctly, always make sure to attach an antenna when using devices that transmit radio signals. Always, you need to attach uh, uh, this antenna to your modem before sending any, uh, transmitting any radio signal. So, let's see what are the LoRaWAN network servers. Uh, we have a uh, different, many, many, many different uh, LoRaWAN network servers. I brought some of them that uh, we are working with and quite famous, the Tink, uh, the Tinks network or in short TTN. And this is the link for learning uh, the Tinks network. Uh, 
dot uh, org and um, you can go here and you can follow uh, every documentation about uh, every part of it and uh, is um, uh, quite comprehensive documentation and the other one is helium and uh, www.helium.com and you can go and uh, read about uh, helium if you want to if you like to work with helium network server and uh, chirp stack uh, that is in the link uh, chirpstack.io and the other one is uh, Lore IoT. It means Lore One IoT, and this is in LoRaIoT.io. So I will talk about these three uh, Lore One network servers. TTN. TTN is the Things Network, uh, which is a global uh, collaborative Internet of Things ecosystem that creates networks, devices, and solutions using uh, Lore One. And TTN runs the TTS Community Edition, uh, the Things Stack Community Edition, which is a crowdsource, open, and decentralized LoRaWAN network for IoT solution. The word crowdsource refers to the collaborative effort of community or group of individuals in building and maintaining the network infrastructure. It means that the network's infrastructure is not solely owned or uh, controlled by a single entity, but rather it is collectively deployed, uh, developed and operated by a distributed network of uh, contributors. So, in the case of TTN, individuals, organizations, and cities deploy uh, their own gateways to create a network of coverage. And these gateways receive and forward messages uh, from IoT devices uh, to the TTN servers. By having multiple uh, contributors that deploy gateways, uh, the network coverage expands and allows for a larger geographical reach and better connectivity for IoT devices. So TTN operates on a public and open spectrum allowing anyone to use it without requiring a subscription or license. The network is built using gateways that receive and forward messages um, uh, from IoT devices to the TTN server. And TTN offers a range of tools and services for developers, including APIs, device management, and data integration options uh, that you can find it in the um, TTN um, dashboard. And uh, TTN supports uh, secure and encrypted communication between devices and applications using LoRaWAN protocols. And TTN platform allows users to deploy IoT application and services as why we are using and collect and analyze data and trigger actions based on the received data. Helio is a decentralized uh, wireless network built on the Helium blockchain that utilizes LoRaWAN technology. The Helium network service is a key component of the Helium network infrastructure and uh, it provides the functionality to manage and coordinate communication between LoRaWAN devices and the Helium blockchain. And the Helium network server facilitates uh, device registration, activation and secure communication between devices and applications. Helium network server implements routing protocols that allow devices um, to connect to the network through uh, nearby Helium hotspots. And hotspot is a gateway or um, access point that allows IoT devices to connect to the internet using wireless uh, technologies like LoRa. And um, uh, Helium leverages the proof of coverage and POC uh, consensus algorithm to ensure that hotspots are providing sufficient coverage and connectivity. And the network server is designed to uh, be lightweight, scalable, and reliable, and supporting a large number of devices and applications. Also, Helium uh, offers APIs and integration options for developers to build and deploy IoT applications on top of the Helium network. And uh, the Helium network server enables data collection, storage, forwarding, and uh, allowing applications to, res uh, to retrieve and analyze data from LoRaWAN devices. So uh, you can see there are uh, different capabilities of the uh, Helium network server. And um, 
a chirp stack is uh, is an open source LoRaWAN network server that uh, provides a, a scalable and a robust solution for managing LoRaWAN uh, networks and it offers a complete stack of components including the network server application server and joint server like LoRaWAN uh, sorry like um, TTN uh, or the other network server and uh, and uh, like the LoRaWAN versions that I showed you in uh, that we have, uh, Chirp Stack is a LoRaWAN network server. So it has, uh, uh, it's, it's now is based on the LoRaWAN version 1.1 that has joint server and network server and application server and to support end-to-end -end LoRaWAN connectivity. And Chirp Stack supports both uh, public and private LoRaWAN network deployments and allowing flexibility in network setup. And also it provides device management functionalities such as device activation, configuration, and firmware updates for efficient management of LoRaWAN devices. Also, it supports multiple regional parameters, enabling deployment in various geographical regions with different LoRaWAN frequency plans and regulation. And the Chirp Stack Network Server handles LoRaWAN specific tasks like device registration, authentication, and message routing between devices and applications. As you can see, they have too many uh, common uh, tasks that because they are all of this Chirp Stack, TTN, and Helium, they are all mm, LoRaWAN network server. And uh, now it's time to um, uh, to the practical part. Uh, let's see uh, how we can connect via the um, LoRaWAN um, LoRa connection. Uh, LoRa technology uh, uh, based on the LoRa one protocol. So uh, I divided it in two parts. One is backend side. Uh, that is uh, what happens in the cloud or server side. We first create an TTN account. We will work with TTN as a LoRa one network server. If you like, you can follow Helium. Uh, there are lots of uh, um, Sources, uh, sources that you can follow and see how you create your account and how you uh, configure it. But in this uh, uh, lecture, I prepared it for uh, the, thing, the things network TTN. So first of all, uh, for the backend side, we have four steps. And first one is create a TTN account and then create an application, then register a device in that application, uh, uh, and then register your device to the TTN application. Uh, actually, these two happens together. That's why um, I wrote it as a fourth step, but this is uh, how after creating application, you need to uh, create or add or register a device. And then uh, that is how it is done. And then in the client side, that is uh, the device, uh, you connect, you have five steps. And the first step is you connect the antenna to the modem. I wrote it because it's important, as I mentioned before. And you connect the modem to your Pico. Uh, you can see the slide wiring, how you connect it. And uh, you create a project folder and name it Laura Pico W or whatever you name you like, you call it. But in this lecture, I call it Laura Pico. W and you create a main.py uh, file and copy the following code. When I say following code, I mean you should follow this link. In that link, you will find the code for main.py and uh, the code for library lora1.py. And uh, step five is create a file and name it lora1.py and copy the following code into that. Uh, be careful about the um, naming L, because this is the library that we will use in our main.py. So it should be main.py and this um, library, we call it lora1.py. So back inside, we first create an uh, TTN account. Before uh, uh, start everything, please make sure you have coverage and uh, then um, you can check your place that you have coverage uh, on the under the uh, LoRa one or no by checking this link the t the things network org slash map. So go to uh, this link the things network 
org and click the sign up button if you have already an account choose login button and choose the experience and explore with the things network plan because there are two plans you should choose this one and click the join the TTN and the things network button and then click sign up for free and then enter your email and address and check mark the box for accepting the policy and click the sign up to the things ID button this one and then uh, create an application click the console here when you have your app when you have your account here you can see my name when you have your account then you should go to the um, click here and go to the console tab in your profile account and then select europe one recommended and choose the login with the things id option to login and choose continue as your account email button to login and then you will end up on the page like this then select go to applications you have to go to get phase and go to applications if you don't have get phase we, that's why you just uh, check if you have coverage or no because if there is already get phase installed somewhere then you can see if you have coverage or no if you have then you just follow go to applications we don't need to go and buy our lora one get phase and install it so we don't need to go to this system now we have coverage we know that we have coverage and then we go to go to applications and then choose the create application button here as you can see i have uh, other applications here but uh, here with this plus button you can create application and then give the application an appropriate id name and description and then click the create application button like this as you can see i name this is owner that is my name and application id i uh, name it my iot app this is very very uh, common name and maybe you need to change it may otherwise you will get error that this id already exists so it would be better to use numbers or um um, or if numbers are not allowed just choose a name that you can create your application and uh, don't uh, and don't stuck by the name application id name so and then application name i named it my IoT app, app and then in the and then you push the create application button and then when the application is created you will be redirected to the application page like here and my iot app and then after that step you need to register a device here this button add end devices or register end device you will see uh, the new version it is register end device like i uh, wrote here so click on that here we have two options either you can choose select uh, the end device in the lora one device repository that uh, mm, by choosing this uh, uh, you can choose from this combo box what is your uh, manufacturer of your end device for example raspberry pi for raspberry pi pico but if you uh, if now we are working with Raspberry Pi Pico W and um, um, as it's shown, it's uh, not supported in this combo box, so I don't recommend this. Then we need to choose the second option, that is uh, end um, inter end device uh, specifies um, manually. So we choose this one. After choosing this, uh, these um, fields are activated. Uh, after they are activated you need to uh, enter uh, your frequency plan LoRaWAN version and regional parameters uh, version uh, so uh, you need to fill the required fields as follows frequency plan as we are uh, 
uh, I living in uh, Europe. I at least I live in Europe, so I need to choose the frequency eight hundred sixty. Three to eight hundred seventy, as I explained before, eight hundred sixty-six, and uh, um, it is a, a spreading factor nine for RX two that is recommended, and for LoRaWAN version, this is the uh, LoRaWAN specification one point uh, zero, uh, that mm, the second uh, version of one zero one point zero is chosen. So it is lower one specification of 1.0. And then you need to set the version of the uh, original parameters to uh, RP001, uh, regional parameters, uh, 1.0.2. And here, when you see provisioning information, this is join UI, that join UI uh, key that I uh, talked about it, that is your in the previous version, it was app UI, and now it is named uh, join UI. You need to fill it with zeros. Put all the zero here and then push the confirm button. Uh, so, uh, fill in the join UI and dev UI and app key fields as follows and click register and device button. Uh, here, the join UI or app UI is what identifies the application you will be creating on um, whichever platform you choose in the next step. And the dev UI is a unique key that identifies your end device uh, here, your Pico W. And uh, you just generate one, click generate, and it will be generated. For me, it's 70, B3, D5, 7E. D005, E6, F8. So if it ends up with F8. And then uh, the app key is the encryption key that will be used to encrypt uh, all the data uh, will be sending to the gateway. This is a private key that should be kept secure and otherwise others will be able to send data to your application. I explain all of these keys, but again, I wrote it here just to remind you. So generate one, click the generate button and it will generate for you this uh, app key. And uh, for example, in my case, it is 81. Now my Pico Dev UI is uh, this number and my application key is this number. And end device ID, this field will be filled automatically. You don't need to fill it. It will create it automatically. And after that, uh, push the button register end device. And that's it. All the thing we needed to do in the backend side is done. Now we go to the uh, client side. In the client side, first of all, you need to do wiring. This is my Pico that I connected to the um, modem. And my antenna is connected to my modem. And uh, this is how our uh, connect our RX and TX to the Pico UART uh, RX and TX port. And this is the red one is the power and black one is the end. And these two are RX and TX. If there is a problem in sending data, either exchange RX and TX cables or check the voltage uh, supply. Also, I brought it, but the freezing schematic uh, will be available on GitHub. So you can see how they are connected um, if it's not uh, quite um, visible for you. So after that, we are going to write our code that connect our um, Pico using that uh, LoRaWAN um, modem, I mean this one, um, and send the data. First of all, the first step is that import necessary libraries and uh, modules. So uh, from machine, we import pin because we are going to work with the pins. And uh, from uh, machine, we import UART and we import uh, uh, Binasky and time. And from uh, LoRaWAN, that is the file that we have 
I uh, I told you that you need to create a file and name it lora1.py. This is library. And from that, we are importing lora. And we import a struct that this um, library, I talked about it, that how we format our data before we send it to the lora. So, uh, we define the port pins. Uh, we set up the necessary variables and object here. Uh, decoded data, this initialize an empty string variable, uh, decoded data, which might be used to store uh, receive messages later, not might be. We will use it and um, uh, we use, um, we had this code before and this uh, this line, line nine, uh, sets up a GPIO pin with number 25. As we know, it is the built-in LED uh, and it could be used to contour an LED connected to that pin. And SER uh, equal to UART zero with board rate um, 115,200. This creates a UART object there with UART port 0 and a baud rate of um, 115,200 and establishes a serial connection with the uh, with our modem that it was called ASR 650X LoRa1 and uh, so uh, we use um, Raspberry Pi Pico WGP0 um, as a TX and GP1RX for connecting the LoRaWAN modem to our Raspberry Pi Pico W. And then the next um, slide, uh, sorry, the next step is that initialize and configure uh, LoRaWAN. Uh, LoRa equals to LoRa ser. This creates an instance of the LoRa class or LoRa. Uh, that is a class that we have written and passing the ser UART object as an argument here. The ser that we created before here is passed to this LoRa. And then uh, we uh, initialize the LoRa1 modem with default settings. And then here, we this LoRa dot configure with these three fields. They are this configures the LoRa one modem with the device dev UI, device UI, app UI, and app key. And these values need to be replaced with the valid credential specific to the device. So, if you remember in TTN, we created, we set these things. We generate device UI and we, gener we generate app key and we fill this app UI or join UI with all zeros. So exactly that number you should replace here. If you remember for me, it was F8, this number that ended with F8. I will show you again. This is exactly this number, device UI I'm copying there as the first argument as a device UI. And the second one is app UI or join UI that I told you it should be all zeros. And the third argument is that one app key that uh, if you look at here, it's the number has uh, ended with 81 and we had it here as a 81 that I replaced it here. So exactly you should put these three values here. And then after that, this is the join the LoRa1 network. Uh, first of all, uh, LoRa.start join uh, initiates the join process with the LoRa1 network. And uh, there is a while not LoRa.check join status. Um, and uh, then time.sleep 0 0.1 millisecond. Uh, it, it, this loop waits until the join process is completed by checking the join status repeatedly every 0 0.1 seconds. So, sorry, this is second, not millisecond. So after that, if everything is uh, um, work, uh, I mean, the connection is successful, then you will see join success. Then uh, the next step is prepare the LoRa1 message format. Uh, I, I, um, I talked about it in the libraries uh, part of MicroPython that we have a struct. And this struct pack, pack, pack your messages. For example, here, the mock values of one and two, uh, that each has uh, 
in two bytes because we say that h and h and h is a consists of two bytes and this is the big endian system big endian h h for each of the values and um, it this creates a binary data structure i mean a struct with um, with these values uh, one and two that um, each re um, represented by two bytes um, so the resulting binary data is uh, sorted in the uh, variable s and this um, variable s as you can see it's passed here and this converts the binary data in s to a, a hexadecimal string representation as you can see hexilify uh, step six is send and receive the messages and this code is a loop that continuously sends LoRa1 messages and receive responses from the uh, LoRa1 modem uh, while true starts uh, this while true starts an infinitive uh, infinite loop and uh, it means that it will keep running until interrupted externally. And LoRa dot send message one one s. This line sends a LoRa one message using the LoRa object send message method, and it specifies the port number as one, that indicates a confirmed transmission and includes the message payload s. And the print send message. This line prints a message to the console indicating that the message has been sent and time.slip10 uh, this adds a delay of 10 seconds before process, uh, proceeding to the next iteration of the loop and it pauses the execution uh, for 10 seconds and um, response equal LoRa dot uh, receive message. It, this line receives a LoRa one message using the LoRa objects uh, receive message method and stores it in the variable response. And then if response is not equal uh, this quotation, this condition checks if the response variable is not an empty string. This is an empty string. So and not equal to this and indicate that a valid message has been received and then print received uh, an end uh, in the, uh, equals to um, colon in the quotation um, it means that if a valid message is received this line prints the message uh, to the console and the end uh, equals um, uh, to the quotation uh, colon arguments is used to append the colon after the printed message instead of the default new line character and print response this line prints the receipt message to the console and the loop then continues to repeat the process of sending a message waiting for a response and printing it if a valid response is um, received uh, so it repeats i uh, then if um, indefinitely unless interrupted um, externally so as you can see if you are successful join success will happen and the data that is sent is here as as you remember i told you that is in hexadecimal format you will uh, receive it uh, so this is from the our, our um, the client side when we, we say that is sent these two number one and two one and two and in the ttn console format also you should check in the live data that you are uh, getting uplink data message when the device is sending data that it is here one and two you can see in the hexadecimal format the number one and the number two here this is sending regularly the these messages this is the uh, console that you can check if you receive your data so this is a mock data if you are working with your sensors you can have uh, you can send any data from any sensors you want just you need to uh, replace the code that is sending the data here by your uh, sensor data so uh, the summary let's say that we define LoRa and LoRa1 we got to know the LoRa1 network and uh, its architecture we learn about the LoRa1 protocol specifications such as message types, security keys, device classes, 
device activation authentication and spreading factors that they are very important uh, concept in LoRaWAN protocol. And uh, we learn about uh, LoRaWAN uh, network coverage and we got familiar with different LoRaWAN uh, network servers and we learn how to configure a LoRaWAN network server as we learn in uh, TTN as an example, but you can work with any other um, TTN, uh, sorry, any other LoRaWAN network server that you like. And also we learn how to send data uh, using LoRaWAN network. Uh, before I say that, uh, this is the next, oh, sorry, the slide of summary and hands-on are um, inverse. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to say that uh, you can connect your Raspberry Pi Pico now to the LoRaWAN gateway by this knowledge and send your sensor data into the TTN network server. And you can also try other network servers like Helium or even ChirpStack if you want to take an extra step into LoRaWAN network server. So the next lecture will be about data visualization and dashboard. Uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, lecture and, uh, and thanks for your time. If you have any feedback or question, uh, please uh, select me or uh, you are welcome to the IoT lab in Kalmar. Uh, thank you and bye.